we can maybe uh, start now. I'm sure people will uh, trickle in as we as I start the introductions, but they have the the, the flyer anyway for reference. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is our last seminar, uh, IEO seminar of the year. And today uh, it's uh, our honor to uh, host uh, Martin Blix and uh, Eric uh, uh, Hakunes from uh, Stanford University. Uh, today we'll talk about Sweden experiment with uh, welfare services and uh, the presenter will be Martin. Martin Blix is a research scholar at the Research Institute for Industrial Economics in Sweden. His work is focused on understanding the effects of um, digitalization, welfare policy, and structural change. He has held several senior management, management positions, including director of the Division of Budget Tools in the Swedish Ministry of Finance, chief economist at the Ministry of Industry, and advisor at the Swedish Central Bank, where I met Martin um, year, many years ago. He has also uh, worked at the European Central Bank and uh, been secretary to the Swedish Prime Minister in the Commission on the Future Challenges of Sweden. In this webinar, Martin will summarize uh, the main findings from the, his newly published book, Privatizing Welfare Services, Lessons from the Swedish Experiment, that was published by Oxford University Press in this year. So many will know that the country uh, has high taxes uh, and generous social benefits. It's the Nordic model, but how this has been accomplished is, is less well known, and that's what um, we'll talk about today. In fact, uh, Sweden political economy has produced uh, a juggernaut of social welfare uh, state while delegating almost one fifth of all tax financed welfare production to for profit firms. Um, the, uh, the book looks at the, the Swedish experience uh, like a laboratory of institutional design. That's why we thought it would be interesting for fund staff and others to listen to this presentation. Uh, and I let Martin uh, draw conclusions from, from his work. Just um, a few words about uh, Professor Eric Hanushek, uh, who will discuss these findings in light of his uh, multi-year work on in the area of education. Uh, Professor Hanushek is a Poland Jan Hanna Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. He has been a leader in the development of economic analysis of educational issues, and his widely cited research spans many policy related education topics. So if you're interested in education, you should read a lot of his work because it, it really shaped uh, a lot of thinking. In his latest book, The Knowledge Capital of Nations, uh, education and the economics of growth, he identifies a close link between a country's labor force skills and economic growth. So this would have been interesting discussion also for the previous um, analysis by Adam Tooze on shutdown that we had last week. But I leave the floor to Martin to begin with. Martin has a presentation and uh, you can share now, Martin, when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta. So, uh, thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. Nicoletta, I think we met, that was 20 years ago on, on a, like a flight to Bank of Canada or something like that. Yeah, so, we, shouldn't have, we shouldn't go in the years <laughs> dimension. <laughs> anyway, okay. so thanks for the introduction. So, uh, I'll talk about this book that uh, we published a few months ago. So, it's co-authored with uh, Hendrik Jordahl. Uh, and so the idea, the motivation for writing this book is really, really several things. Uh, one is that we believe that it's not so uh, known outside of Sweden that a lot of these welfare services are in fact done by for-profit companies. So Milton Friedman has, has come to Sweden also. So we wanted to show under the hood of the welfare state how, how it works and how it has evolved and to draw some lessons from that. Another thing that we wanted to uh, highlight is that many of these, uh, th the key thing here is learning from the quantitative studies. So there's a lot of theory and in the theory you can, you know, you can land in almost any conclusion, 
but we wanted to survey the empirical evidence because what we really care about are the outcomes after all. And we wanted to summarize them in, in easily accessible terms that is helpful uh, for other, others to learn from. Uh, and finally, uh, it's a bit controversial. It's very controversial. Uh, it's been controversial in Sweden uh, ever since the beginning. And I believe it's controversial in other countries to allow uh, for-profit companies to use uh, uh, taxpayers' money uh, to deliver services. So those are kind of things at the outset that motivated us to, to write this book. A brief outline of, of this talk. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll start by saying a few words about uh, why things were privatized, uh, why we introduced choice and competition into, into tax finance welfare services. Uh, then I'm going to focus on two areas, uh, education and, and independent schools. Uh, and then I'll talk about healthcare uh, and a little bit of telemedicine. So the book also contains other areas. We look at care of the elderly uh, and, and other areas as well. But uh, my experience is that it becomes a little bit too much to cover everything. But I'll be happy to take questions on, on, on other aspects of welfare services as well, if, if you have them. And finally, I think a few words of, of learning from, from the Swedish experiment. Uh, and I, just to you know, go a little bit ahead of my conclusions, I think that this experience has been rather positive in Sweden. Uh, so some of the problems that have been seen in the UK and elsewhere uh, have not materialized in Sweden in the same way. I mean, there are problems and we should learn from them. But overall, I think it's been, it's been a, a, a good uh, a set of reforms. I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, there was a, a central issue of The Economist magazine where they looked at the size of government uh, and especially because a lot of advanced economies, uh, I believe including the United States, uh, are expected to have rising shares of government spending as a share of GDP uh, in the years ahead. Uh, and of course, we know some of the reasons for that. Uh, pandemic spending, of course, is the obvious one, but of course, also the underlying pressures from aging population and that people are expecting more and better welfare services. And sort of if you don't do anything, then uh, the government tends to, to increase in size unless you actively uh, do something to, to try to keep it down. So this issue of the economy is kind of interesting and timely. Uh, so uh, here's a quote. So one task is to maximize the role of markets and individual choice. So the state must also seek to be nimble and efficient. And I think this kind of gets to the core of the issue. Uh, Sweden has a big government uh, and it's very important to have legitimacy for the spending. And uh, if you don't have legitimacy, then it's very hard to uphold uh, this kind of high taxes that are necessary to spend. So privatization, it's not done because it's fun. It's done because you want to uh, induce uh, more uh, or better welfare services to get more value for, for the money spent. So that's the goal. It's not done because it's fun. It's because we want to get better results, really. So going back a few steps, you know, why was it done in Sweden of all places? Well, the 1970s and 1980s, uh, saw a big increase in the welfare state. So there was like a, a soul searching of what more could the government do? So it increased some things that were popular, such as childcare uh, and other social uh, welfare programs. Uh, but the macroeconomic policies were also, uh, uh, also out of line. So things were going into deficits. We had inflation unemployment problems were rising, and then there was like a big crash in the early 1990s. And this crash sort of led, uh, spurred a set of uh, institutional reforms. Uh, so one set of reforms I think is fairly well known, I won't say so much about it, just very briefly, uh, the kind of things that you are familiar with, I suppose, like central bank independence, inflation targeting, uh, there was also oversight and change to the budget process in the, in the parliament. So going from uh, bottom up uh, budgeting to top down with expenditure ceilings and nominal terms a couple of years ahead, you know, to trying to get the fiscal discipline uh, in place. So this kind of institutional reforms of the overall macro fiscal framework. 
Then there were reforms uh, to product markets, the kind of thing that OECD uh, likes to recommend, uh, deregulation of telecoms, electricity, uh, trains, etc. And these uh, gave productivity benefits some 10 years later in, in the beginning of the 2000s. But like I said, the least well-known reforms were to social welfare. Uh, and I guess the, one of the reasons for instigating these reforms was that there was a dissatisfaction with the way that uh, welfare services were carried out uh, in the 1980s. Even the trade unions, because uh, they had people working in these uh, welfare services, uh, and it was the absence of choice, this big monolithic uh, sort of government that tells you, no, you, you have to do this. There was really no flexibility uh, and especially difficult when it was scaled up. So uh, the, the winds were changing and uh, Milton Friedman was brought in and there were big reforms that started in the, in the early 1990s. I don't want to go into a, a very a lot of detail into this timeline, but uh, I think it's interesting to highlight two aspects of how and when uh, things were privatized. So uh, the first point is that there were there was not a central government initiative. So the first steps towards privatization occurred at the local level, at the municipal level. So there was uh, a, a preschool in the middle of uh, a kindergarten in the mid 1980s. There was a, uh, a care of the elderly in the suburb of Stockholm, also in the late uh, 1980s. Uh, and what happened was that these kind of initiatives caused a lot of attention. And then the central government had to catch up and to do regulation afterwards. But so the, it, it started at the local level. So, so this is one feature of, of the timeline. The other one is a little bit more political. Uh, the reforms for uh, private alternatives was, of course, introduced by, by a centre-right government. But the socialist government uh, had lots of opportunities to uh, reverse these reforms, but they didn't. Throughout the 1990s, they uh, let the reforms uh, continue. Uh, they changed perhaps a little bit of the things uh, and altered uh, uh, some things, but mainly the reforms uh, were allowed to continue. So th these are kind of two interesting things. The reform started mainly in around the 1990s with the education reform, with a voucher given to every student, and the reforms were allowed to continue and in indeed uh, more. Tap uh, into the session. door. Then uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages to uh, to private privatization. So. The idea to bring in private alternatives for profit alternatives, of course, is that you get the benefits of competition. With more competition, you have uh, induced quality and you induce uh, reducing costs. Uh, so that's one of the main purposes. And the idea with uh, doing that to private welfare services, uh, with welfare services, is to uh, create these quasi markets that were sort of pioneered by Julian Lagrange and, and others. But the disadvantages and risks uh, with introducing for profit, uh, there are several risks. You can have asymmetric information between the provider and, and the one who's getting the, the, the service. Uh, you can have cream skimming. I've found a, a picture that I thought was a good uh, show of cream skimming where like the providers try to get the best and try to discriminate against those that have high costs or, or otherwise uh, perhaps not as good. And you might also have uh, an incentive to reduce quality, because if you reduce quality in the short term, uh, you could uh, increase profits. Now, the idea is, of course, you have to try to balance these, the benefits of, uh, of this competition and choice with the potential downsides that are well known. So in theory, any, anything can happen, but what really matters, of course, are the outcomes. There are also some misconceptions, I think, in, in Sweden and other countries. Uh, and my co-author, Henry Jordahl, he has a paper on this where he looks at what do people believe in the country? And it turns out that there's a vast exaggeration of beliefs in what the actual profit level are uh, for these uh, welfare uh, firms in the, in, that are providing these services. 
So the population believes that the profit margins are on average about 26%, but the actual level is an order of magnitude lower than that. So there's a lot of misconception about the profits, but if you ask people about, uh, about what they value, then it turns out that they really value this choice. So uh, on the one hand, the population is in favor of choice. And then on the other hand, even though uh, uh, the, the profit levels are not so high, it turns out, you know, you can have this kind of not inconsistent beliefs, but they're not necessarily super coherent either. So there's some misconceptions about how these how the, um, markets work. So what does it look like? So we have uh, put together numbers for uh, all these welfare areas that have been privatized. Uh, and it turns out that the area with the highest degree of uh, privatization is in personal assistance to the disabled. So this is one person who, who is helping somebody uh, who's handicapped or needs help throughout the day. Uh, and it's almost 80%. Uh, the lowest share of uh, private providers is in specialized healthcare. So this is hospitals, you know, the big hospitals and, and this kind of costly specialized uh, uh, systems of healthcare. And then in, in between, you have various degrees of, of privatization. Uh, and as Nicoletta said in the introduction, uh, if you add together all the areas uh, and to look at all the costs, it turns out that about one fifth or 17% uh, of all welfare services are provided by for-profit companies. Uh, it turns out also, uh, I will not speak so much about it, but that the personal assistance to disabled is the area with the most problems because there's a lot of, uh, it's very easy for uh, criminals and those that want to sort of milk the system to, to get money uh, because there's so much money in this personal assistance. So unfortunately, this is an area where you need, should have more regulation and better regulatory hurdles. But in other areas, it's the experiences have, have been better. So let me start with education. So in education, as I said, the main reform was in the early 1990s when with this voucher system, where the voucher uh, essentially follows the student to uh, the school that they choose. Uh, and although it's been tinkered with uh, a bit throughout the years, uh, shifting here and there, uh, main, the main element remains the same as it was in uh, when the reform was instigated. So uh, private alternatives prior to 1990 essentially were non-existent. So this is really the start of, of uh, private free, uh, free schools that are tax financed. It turns out that uh, compulsory school has increased fairly steadily, but uh, secondary school is, is where uh, the, the private uh, alternatives have been expanding more rapidly than in the other uh, sorts of, of schooling. So what are the uh, experiences? So we've collected all the, the papers that have been published uh, here in Sweden and uh, in, in, in good journals and summarized it. And the summaries are uh, provided in the book, easily accessible. You can see all the results and all the authors. But just a, a bird's uh, eye view uh, for compulsory education. So a largely positive experiences for, for compulsory education. So we get more satisfied students, better higher value added, uh, and, and better results. Uh, it turns out the costs are also lower for these uh, for profit companies. The results are a bit more mixed for upper secondary education. Uh, while the results are still good, uh, and that uh, the students in, in these schools are more inclined than in municipal schools to go on to higher education. Uh, there are also problems. And one of the problems turns out to be grade inflation. Um, so um, these for-profit schools have significantly higher uh, grades than, uh, than the municipal ones. And I guess, you know, grade inflation, it's, it shouldn't be rocket science because the students like higher grades, uh, the teachers don't get complained from the parents, the parents like higher grades, and the principals of the schools, oh, everybody likes higher grades, except for society as a whole, they become, the grades become less, uh, less meaningful. And this is a design flaw from the beginning, uh, where there should have been an anchor for uh, with a Nash, uh, an exam that was graded nationally instead of being graded at the schools. So this, this is an avoidable problem. 
Segregation is one of the issues that's uh, a lot discussed. Uh, education and, and these for-profit schools are uh, quite a lot in the in the political debate, and there's a, a, a perception that they have increased segregation. So segregation in Sweden is at low levels, but uh, it's increased in the past few years. Now the issue is, have these free schools contributed to the segregation or not? Well, it turns out that uh, if you look at the evidence, uh, first of all, there's no evidence that the schools have uh, strategic behavior, so they still locate uh, in areas where there are disadvantaged students. It also turns out that you can attribute most of the increased segregation to housing segregation. So we had large immigration to Sweden in the last uh, 20 years or so, and uh, people that are moving to areas where the housing is, is cheaper, it also tends to be how, where the schools are not as good. So although choice is probably contributed a bit to the segregation, most of the explanation is, is housing segregation. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's also no evidence of systematic discrimination. Uh, in Swedish law, it's, it's, uh, this, it's not allowed, it's against the law, but of course it can happen. Uh, but there have been some studies that have looked at, at this on a systematic level, there was no evidence, but there have been uh, signs of sort of soft discrimination. So there was one study uh, where somebody sent out fake inquiries to schools, and uh, some of the for-profit schools were less, uh, less answering to those that presented medical problems, etc. So a little bit of soft discrimination and also some uh, examples of discrimination. But at the system level, we have not found any uh, significant discrimination uh, in, in, this, in the high, high school education uh, selection. Let me turn to healthcare and telemedicine uh, now. <clears throat> so, uh, Tele healthcare was privatized a bit later. Uh, the main reform was in 2008, which allowed a, a freedom of choice where patients are allowed to choose their provider. Uh, even before this government reform, a few years earlier, some of the regions had started to, to provide this freedom of choice uh, model. So uh, what you see in this diagram are the shares of uh, uh, private production in, in different types of healthcare. Uh, in terms of specialized healthcare, so the hospitals essentially, it's not moved much since the 2000s. Essentially, it's staying at uh, six or seven percent. It turns out that uh, primary healthcare is much more popular to be privatized. So it's been going up uh, fairly continuously over these years, and it's now almost 40 percent of uh, of all healthcare. So if you look at uh, all these the papers that have analyzed and, and uh, assess the outcomes of for-profit in, in, uh, in healthcare. So what do we find? Well, uh, already in the, in the beginning, the, the quality was fairly high in the Swedish healthcare system. And it turns out that there were small quality differences uh, between private and uh, public alternatives. Uh, the more positive thing is that uh, access uh, has improved, so it became easier to access both uh, primary and specialized healthcare. Uh, so this has been a, a benefit of, of this uh, kind of reforms. Then there are specific, more uh, isolated studies. There's one study that finds that uh, Sweden's only emergency hospital uh, has lower costs and higher productivity than uh, the comparable uh, public hospitals. And this is even though the hospital has higher salaries uh, than, than the public ones, it still turns out that they're more and more cost efficient. So overall, it's been uh, fairly successful, although the differences in quality have not been uh, so great. Let me turn to uh, telemedicine. Uh, this is uh, a bit more controversial. Uh, and uh, uh, so the way it works very briefly, is that uh, in Sweden, we have this mobile bank ID, which is provided by the banks, not by the public sector. And almost 90% of the adult population have these bank IDs. And through these IDs, you can access different for-profit providers uh, anywhere in Sweden, or you don't even have to be in Sweden to access these providers. And it started in 2016, uh, didn't exist before 2016. Uh, and uh, the pay, uh, how much is paid, is similar to in physical healthcare, 
uh, or sometimes lower, sometimes even zero. So it became very, very popular. Uh, and there was initially a very large subsidy. And the subsidy was so large that it had to be lowered quite dramatically, very quickly, because it was, it was so popular. So some of the advantages with this kind of telemedicine, uh, very obvious advantages perhaps, to avoid unnecessary travel, and it's good, especially now in times of a pandemic, of course. But also you get better matching, so it's more efficient because you can match patients to, to doctors uh, with, a, with a better matching of skills. You can also have language, better matching, so somebody has, who does not speak English or Swedish or whatever can be matched to somebody who speaks that language. But then the disadvantages are that uh, you could have uh, overconsumption because the barriers to access these tax finance services is so much lower when you don't have to go there. Uh, so there are these worries about overconsumption and that it's harder to, to diagnose. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions on that, but let me now focus on, on the outcomes. So it uh, increased very rapidly in Sweden from 2016, as I said, when it started, there was nothing at all. And now uh, telemedicine accounts for about 11% of all visits in primary healthcare. So it's really an astounding uh, increase in, in telemedicine through these years. And these firms are also exporting their uh, models to other countries, so Germany, UK, etc. So some of these countries are not only uh, uh, doing this in, in, in Sweden. So I wanted to show you a, a little bit of interest in, in what kind of age and gender distribution. So this is data from, from 2020, so last year. Uh, so what you see is the number of visits uh, according to age and gender. And it turns out that a lot of uh, visits are for children uh, in the early ages. And then uh, why does it increase so much uh, before the age of 20? That's the green line that I've uh, shown there. Well, it turns out that uh, age 20 is the year when you have to start to pay. Before the age of 20, this is free of charge for children. After the age of 85, which is the other green line that you can see, it's also free of charge. But uh, the dramatic increase is initially when people will understand that soon I will have to pay for it myself. Uh, then it goes down very rapidly. Uh, but we see that uh, from the pandemic, older people were increasingly using these services, although the majority is still uh, in, in, the, in the younger ages. Also a big difference between men and women, uh, almost three times more women than men are accessing these services when, when the uh, difference is at its biggest. Uh, which I can kind of reflects also physical healthcare. It also looks a bit like that. Uh, finally, now you see this declining curve. I would expect that in the years ahead, uh, you'll say a more U-shaped kind of uh, curve, so that as the aging population will be more uh, digitally versatile, they will start to use these services quite more. So you know, you probably have to expect to see reforms to try to make. Uh, uh, so, so this is, does not become uh, too costly. So let me round up and I hope I'm not uh, going over time too much uh, and to uh, draw some conclusions. So this is really an experiment uh, that, that's done with giving so much of a large welfare state uh, spending to for-profit companies. And the key, uh, of course, not so controversial is to be able to deliver quality of services, uh, and that's the legitimacy of the large welfare state, but it's also the legitimacy of, of having, uh, of privatizing services. You can't uh, deliver them, uh, the whole system uh, is, is not really so credible. And some of the avoidable mistakes, uh, as I mentioned, grade inflation, there should have been an, an anchor with uh, uh, nationally graded exams. And we should also be uh, better at using technology. Some of these uh, private providers in telemedicine, for example, uh, started out providing something nationally, and then the regulation is catching up and it's making it more difficult to uh, use scale and network effects, which are like the key uh, benefits from, from uh, digital technologies. So welfare services in Sweden account for a very large share, in about 20% of GDP. And, uh, if it doesn't work out well, then, of course, like I said, legitimacy might be threatened. And we think that uh, much more reforms should be focused 
on, on caring for the delivery of these services. Now it's been privatized in these last three decades, but we need more uh, tougher monitoring of the services. And there's been a tendency uh, to monitor the private uh, providers much stronger than the public ones. So we argue that you know should uh, examine both the, pu the public and the private providers, because after all, it's almost 80% uh, of, of the welfare services are still in, 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 in public, uh, uh, public provision of, of uh, so much more monitoring, and, and so we need to strengthen regulatory oversight. Uh, for example, using unannounced inspections. So instead of telling the school that we will come in uh, two weeks' time and, and, and investigate the school, unannounced inspections uh, could be very powerful and cheap uh, too. And if welfare services don't work as they're, uh, as they're expected to work, then after some warnings, etc., they should be uh, closed down. Uh, as a deterrent and inducement for to, to show that this is uh, a valuable service and that we, we, we take this uh, seriously. So this has not been done enough, uh, uh, closing down things that don't work. And we propose in the book that one way to, to do these things is to strengthen the existing uh, National Audit Agency. Now, the National Audit Agency, uh, its uh, remit is to look at government and the government agencies. But these uh, welfare services are mainly outside of, uh, of the purview of central government. It's at the local level, the municipal level and the regional level. So uh, these kind of monitoring and things should be uh, put on, on these 20% of GDP that are, that are uh, provided by the municipal level. And one way to do that would be to strengthen the national audit agency. I think I stopped there, and I look forward to comments from Eric and from 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 you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was very clear, and of course, uh, extremely educational, uh, including for myself. I'd like to give the floor to Professor Hanushek. Eric, you have slides. Uh, we're just going to talk. Just whatever you prefer. You're, you're muted. We can't hear you. That I'm just going to give a few overall comments, um, and I think uh, it should be opened up to general discussion and questions. The um, overall, I have to say that I really enjoyed this book, and um, uh, Martin undersold the book because the uh, breadth of the work is really quite stunning. It goes across um, these wide variety of welfare areas, which are in fact, quite different uh, and have different analyses done behind them. And also nicely moves between politics and economics throughout the whole discussion. So it's not uh, as focused as you might get from his giving just the answers to their research. It really is a uh, quite a nice study with a lot of evidence and uh, measures of, and uh, places where you can go to look for individual studies. Now, you have to say at the outset, what I think Martin said is that few people in the world think of Sweden as being a disciple of Milton Friedman, uh, but Sweden is really way, way out in front in many ways. Now, let me give some overall comments that I think uh, can help structure our thinking about this. Um, first, while there are some common themes across the six, six or seven uh, welfare areas that they look at, there's also considerable heterogeneity. And so you can't just say, get the incentives right. It takes a lot more uh, insight into the specific welfare areas that you're talking about. And there are some really interesting observations uh, uh, in history of Swedish politics, which I must say that I didn't fully appreciate till I read this book. I originally was introduced to Swedish politics when I was at the Congressional Budget Office in the US, and this was in the mid 1980s, the previous time when we were concerned about the size of deficits and growing debt. And when I gave talks, 
in my role at CBO, I would often mention the case of Sweden of large deficits, rising debt, and sort of nowhere to go with the taxes that they had. Um, and it's a very interesting transformation from the mid 1980s till today. Um, let me focus a little bit on education. Um, but I should say in the background, the discussion of quasi markets, I think is very instructive. Um, and the key point when you think of quasi markets as opposed to regular uh, private markets is that they want to incorporate political goals and not necessarily just reflect consumer demands. And unlike sort of ordinary markets uh, where prices provide a lot of information, guide demand, prices are generally fixed in quasi markets. And it leads to uh, serious questions about quality that we don't necessarily have when we look at the market for new automobiles or things like that. Um, it is also the case that one of the hopes of quasi markets is that they provide some discipline to public provision. And so that's one of the elements that we should be looking at. I should note that also that um, this discussion is not completely Milton Friedman. In Capitalism and Freedom, when Friedman talked about vouchers for education, which was quite revolutionary, it was not necessarily to meet public goals or to provide efficiency, which is how people today often interpret this, but instead it was to provide choice to individual consumers who might have different interests in what kind of education services they want. So that the original Milton Friedman differs um, both from the way people talk about Milton Friedman and the way quasi markets have actually developed. Now, education is, is political everywhere. Um, and there's a conflict of interest in goals because there are different philosophies of education. And whenever you change education, there are immediate winners and losers. Um, and so this political, political aspect of decisions in education um, really, in general, leads to very selective use of evidence. Um, so part of the story that people, I think, make in, in Sweden or about the Swedish case, and they certainly make in the United States about any privatization or competition in education is that, well, obviously private education causes income inequality or private education causes segregation. So the heart of the Blix and Yordal uh, themes in their book is that you really need empirical evaluation and not philosophy or bad evidence, just the simple correlations that are important for political debates just aren't true in many cases. And that's what we've seen in Sweden. Um, so what are the results in education uh, that we have? Um, I think it's rather modest overall quality gains, um, particularly at the secondary level. There is evidence that it's a more efficient system. It's allowed for expansion of schools at lower cost. Um, and there's not much evidence to suggest that uh, education is really causing increased segregation in Sweden, even though there has been increased segregation in Sweden. Um, but the theme that also is of conclusion that Martin emphasized, I think, is important to restate. Um, it's hard to run quasi markets where you're looking for overall quality improvement. That's one of your goals without good measures of the outcomes that you're interested in. And that's uh, a problem in Sweden where you don't have good measures um, and what uh, Martin calls grade inflation, but it's just that you're not seeing independent measures of where schools are performing. It's also a problem uh, around the world where there's increased pressure against any testing of 
student performance um, in part because people in the schools don't like measurement of what they're doing. Um, the problem with education, of course, is that the results aren't, look, aren't observed for a very long time. And it's not a, an experience goods. So people don't make regular purchases of education. And so the necessity of having some outcome, outcome measurement and accountability for outcomes is clear, but it hasn't just jumped to the forefront in Sweden, nor in other places. So let me conclude very quickly so we can go to more general questions and what Martin has to say about these things. Um, I think for this, for the audience of this discussion today, the big issue is how do you generalize the findings elsewhere? Um, there is this tight linkage to Swedish politics that Martin uh, lays out. Um, and while it's usefully, useful analytically to explain what's been going on and to judge the outcomes in Sweden, it also um, underscores the question of how do you apply it elsewhere? Um, what I have trouble understanding is uh, completely is why did it continue with the different governments in Sweden? There's a discussion of this in the book, but it's not entirely clear. And I also didn't understand, at least from the standpoint of the United States, how you could have such little discussion of the preferences and influences of teachers unions on educational decisions. That's the almost the full story in the United States is the pressure of the teachers unions against such things as competition and measurement of outcomes. Um, so what I think um, they've done in ultimately is a lot more evidence on the usefulness of competition and choice across broad welfare agencies and areas, uh, but they've given us less information on how to introduce this elsewhere or how to make it succeed. And so that's, that's where I think the discussion has to go is how do we take Sweden to the rest of the world? Uh, particularly since few people recognize that Sweden is such a leader in this whole area. So let me, let me turn it back to, the, uh, to Martin and to the audience. Thanks, Eric. I, I'm gonna pass the, uh, the mic again to Martin for a, a, a reaction to your comments. I just wanted to add one which actually expands upon what uh, Eric just said. So I think Sweden may not be as easily exportable as a model. And, and here's the question, is, is my reasoning correct? Because um, although you know the experiment has been going on for, for decades and has been successful, and it's a big share of welfare spending is now in for-profit firms operated. The rest of the operation is in the hands of the Swedish government. And that's been done very well. Whereas in other countries, you know, public schools are, are not particularly spectacular. And so, uh, you know, the you might end up having a situation where you have some very good schools, which are private, uh, and run for profits, and then some very bad schools, which are run by local authorities. Um, and that, you know, I think the US would possibly uh, have some of these um, cases in some states. Uh, you know, I'm Italian, so we had excellent education, but that's, you know, been deteriorating over time, the public education. We don't have a real for profit response at the moment, which is uh, can compete or, you know, substitute for those uh, deficiencies. So, um, I just want a reaction on this, which uh, feeds off what Eric was saying. Martin. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, very good comments, very, uh, very pertinent comments. Uh, I guess how exportable is, is this stuff? I guess you, we'd have to write a second book on that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I like the point, Eric, that you made that each area is different. I mean, that, that's a very important point. I mean, we were like struggling with, should we, you know, write one chapter on each area? But then we thought it's interesting to put this um, at the system level and to try to see what we can learn. But 
I, I, although I only shown a few pieces, I didn't show everything about care of the elderly. It turns out that the lessons are a little bit different for each area. So with education, uh, as I said, with grade inflation, actually initially when uh, when things were prioritized, I think there were like two or three people, or very few people in, in the school inspectorate that was responsible for giving approvals to these schools. So like at the outset of these reforms, the regulatory oversight was essentially unprepared. Uh, and it's only like afterwards that uh, analytical bodies and and the agencies have built up uh, frameworks to to try to uh, to do it. So the, the reforms were rushed through, and uh, some of the oversight that should have been there was not provided initially. So that that's one comment. Another one about the political uh, situation. Of course, you know it's hard to know what was inside the political parties, but I think the main point there is that there was this big dissatisfaction about welfare services in the 1980s. And also the trade unions, the, the blue collar workers, uh, many women that were working in these welfare areas were also dissatisfied because uh, the uh, public sector was not a good employer. I mean, it was inflexible, uh, there was no choice, and the salaries were bad, etc. for all these reasons. So there was a controversy, two different political camps, and, and that one, there was a struggle between them, and one eventually uh, uh, won over. Uh, also on the controversy, what's been controversial has shifted over time. Initially, it was the uh, preschool, uh, which was very controversial. Uh, and then it was the hospitals. There was a law against privatizing emergency hospitals. This has happened in, in the, around 2000. And then now later, it's the, it's the schools. So the, the focus has shifted. And the, the teacher unions, uh, they are now uh, vocally against private schools, although in principle, I mean, they present representing both the, the free schools and the public schools. So the debate, what, what's been uh, controversial, has actually shifted over time. And I think like if I, if I actually were to write another book <laughs> to, to try to export these ideas, I mean, I would point to lessons for each area because nobody can export a whole model. But I think in each area, there are these empirical uh, things that you can find that indicate things that you know could be done differently. Uh, and I come back to this point about sort of beefing up the muscle of analysis and oversight, uh, which benefits not only uh, looking at the private ones, but also the public sector because the public sector has been allowed to do bad things for a long time. So putting them on more equal footing, I think this is something that is probably universally good in, in most countries. But I think I stopped there and I guess we opened the floor to, to other questions. Yeah, we have, a, uh, we have a few questions in the chat and I, I read them out, I'm three or four. Uh, the first uh, came in was, wouldn't student vouchers actually be expected to reduce discrimination? I think this was, uh, one question by Romain Duval. Uh, I read another one uh, by Valerie Serra. Uh, in the analysis of the effects of education vouchers, how did the studies control for selection bias, such as more active parents? So these are two, one more general or more uh, detailed question. Maybe you wanna start with those and then I'll read the second two. Uh, okay, so on, on, the, on the first, uh question. I mean, the reform, the voucher system, its primary goal uh, was not to re reduce discrimination. The, the primary goal was, uh, I mean, one goal was to uh, provide competition so that parents could uh, deselect the school. So if you're unhappy with the school, you deselect that school and go to another one. And, and this at the system level becomes an inducement for uh, both the private and the municipal schools to, uh, to, to both improve. So like the competition effect. Uh, then there are all side effects. And uh, in a system uh, with a heterogeneous population, then this discrimination effect might have been very small when it, when it started. But after we had a lot of immigration, perhaps we will be we are now more worried about this discrimination. And that's why later studies have looked at the effects of uh, of housing and try to ex ex understand how the segregation comes about. 
but the initial reasons had, had not, not, not so much to do with discrimination, but about choice providing a competition effect. Now, I don't specifically remember how, how they were controlling for these kind of things, but I, I think that these effects, I mean, these are studies done in, in good journals, uh, and some of them were published like 15, 20 years ago. So, uh, I mean, you, you used like the, 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 the usual methods for controlling for things. Of course, you cannot control for everything, uh, but most of these uh, empirical findings have been have been uh, found to, to be held up. But I don't remember the specific ways that it was done. But I refer to the original studies. We cite a lot of studies, so I don't remember all the technical details. Um, I have a couple more questions, and then I think we can close because we're getting close to one o'clock. Unless you know more question pop up, please put your hands up, or ideally write the question in the chat. So the uh, uh, a second set of questions is uh, one is from Reza. Are prices charged by private providers controlled? If not, how can costs to the government's budget be contained, especially if everyone goes to most expensive providers? So maybe take that and then I read the second one, which is longer. Okay, so uh, uh, the price is set. So, for example, with the voucher system, that's clear that it's the same amount of money is given to the student, so the money follows the student. When it comes to uh, to, met, to healthcare, it's the same thing. It's the, the regional government has, has set a price. So the competition is not on the price. The competition is pro on providing uh, a quality of service and trying to provide the service uh, at, at a lower cost and more efficiently. But typically in these welfare services, uh, the price or the framework uh, are, are set by the, the public sector. And then the, the private uh, providers, they have to supply whatever that the government requires. So the price mechanism is, is, is not in function. And that's the key thing with the quasi markets, trying to mimic uh, the functioning of a market, but without the, the price mechanism. Great. Yeah, that's um, uh, the, the the last question here is uh, what by again by Valerie, what was the impact of the voucher system on students remaining in the public system? So did basically this competition mechanism work? One of the concerns of a voucher system is that it would divert funding to wealthier families that will pay for private education anyway and away from already poorly funded public schools. Okay, but the, so so maybe I have not explained properly. I mean, the, the the public schools they have the same amount of money per student as as the private one because they get the same amount of money. Uh, initially, uh, these free schools they received uh, at the outset of reform they received eighty percent of the voucher, and then actually social democratic government I think it was in ninety five they increased the voucher to hundred percent. Now. Uh, in later years, there's been a discussion about whether the uh, private schools should get less than the public ones because they are like a school of last resort. So if it's the private school closes down, then the, the, the students will have to go to the public system. But there's no difference. They don't get more money. In fact, uh, there's evidence uh, from other sectors that uh, uh, the public sector gives more money to to uh, to, the, to their own uh, welfare services, for example, in healthcare, there's evidence from the Swedish Competition Agency that sort of cross subsidization from uh, from the public to not well performing uh, public healthcare institutions. So there's no difference in in how much money they get. It's the efficiency and and uh, the quality of the services that's what's driving the competition. Thank you. Um... Eric, do I don't know if you want to add anything to this question. I'd, I'd make a, a couple of comments. One is that um, I think your view of the public schools in Sweden is a little rosy because the uh, overall performance has not been that that high. It's been um, <laughs> on the level of Italian and U.S. performance as opposed to the the uh, top that you see in Europe. Um, secondly, the 
the last question um, um, I interpreted about whether you the voucher system would hurt the people that were remained in the regular system uh, was not so much about the funding, but in the US, the argument has been that the, the most interested parents, the most aggressive parents pull their kids out of school and then the remaining public schools don't have a voice for improvement for doing well, uh, who thinks about the quality of the schools. Um, I haven't seen in the US any real strong evidence that that's the case, but it comes down to in part what are the goals of the system? Um, do you want the most aggressive and most people most interested in education to support all the other kids, or do you want them to also have choice? And these are uh, the tough political questions that come in quasi markets. Let me just briefly comment on that. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, the book is about the privatization, but then when it comes to education, uh, there's been lots of other reforms. So there was a change of the of the school agenda, how things were taught, uh, huge immigration. And so some of the effects of the school system are, do not really come from privatization, but it may have effect, been affected by that. So, I mean, I agree with you totally that all these factors are, are also there, but when it comes to education, many other things have happened as well. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Well, I think you, we, we can all agree to say this was extremely interesting and I would like to thank personally Martin and wish you, um, you know, happy holidays and uh, Eric for his uh, very thoughtful, of course, uh, discussion and, and the, the audience for, for being so interactive. And uh, I wish you for those of us on the East Coast a good lunch to Eric, maybe brunch and to Martin, maybe dinner. And you have a wonderful festive season. And thanks again. I'll see, we'll see you back in January. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, all. Thanks for.